In Michigan, the dominant narrative holds that long prison sentences provide the severe long-term punishment that felons deserve and protects the rest of us from them. People who have committed acts of violence or other serious crime are cast into a category of other and considered fundamentally different from law-abiding citizens. In 2020, Fresh Coast Alliance and Safe and Just Michigan set out to challenge this narrative. Our From the Numbers project hopes to lift the voices of those impacted by the criminal justice system and change the narrative about people who have been incarcerated. Johnson 377-770. For 12 and a half years, that was my first and my last name. My first name was my last name. My last name became my number. I ended up in a predicament like that where my first name was no longer my first name. I was known as a number, not even amongst my peers, but just amongst the institutions that I was in. I didn't get there just by happen chance. I didn't get to that place uh, because I just uh, wound up there. I got there because of choices and decisions that I was making. I remember back in 1993, I was 12 years old, the first time I made a poor decision um, out of ignorance and in my youthful naivety making decisions that I didn't know that they potentially had hard uh, core consequences to them. But nonetheless, I made those decisions. And at that time, I had a slap on the wrist, and it wasn't more than a couple months later, ended up doing the same thing again. Had another slap on the wrist. By the time I was 15, I was on my way in and out of the Muskegon County Youth Home, serving time and um, on delivery of cocaine charges, and another of breaking and entering, got into stealing cars, all that. Ultimately, it led me straight to the uh, Michigan Department of Corrections, where I served a 12 and a half year prison sentence. But I can remember back, it was probably about three months before I was arrested on my charges uh, that sent me to prison. I remember my dad had this conversation with me, and he says, uh, I, was, I, just, I was on tether, and I just beat a, a robbery charge. And I remember my father, he came to visit me for lunch, and, he, and I was telling him about what was going on. I said, man, you know, I lost all my money on this last deal with the lawyer and, and things like that. And he said, man, I, and I said, you know, I'm going to be getting off of, of tether here soon. And I, in, in my mind, I'm thinking, I said, man, I got to hit a lick so I can, get, you know, get some money and get things back going again and selling dope. And he said something that stuck with me. And this is what he said. He says, man, he said, if you keep playing with those guns, he says, you're going to be put in a place to get your attention. And I thought about that. I didn't think about it long, maybe a couple seconds, and I brushed it off as a fluke, and I said, you know, what's this old man No. Less than 90 days later, I was arrested on delivery of cocaine charges, armed robbery, felony firearm, and sat in the county jail for about 10 months and ended up being sent off to the state prison. I get there, and Michigan has a mandatory consecutive sentencing clause attached to all the uh, major drug felonies, and so I had 17 and a half to 50 years to serve in that time. And so while I was there, I got into the flow, uh, began to connect with the same um, guys that I was hanging out with on the streets. And, and I knew in there after a couple of years, I just came to a place of despair. And I knew, I said, man, if I get out of here and just continue doing the same thing over and over and over again, I knew without a shadow of a doubt that I was going to end up back in a place like this. I looked at the time and said, you know, if I serve all this time, I'm going to be in my mind as a 21-year-old. I said, man, I said, I'm going to be old as my dad when I come home. And obviously, you know, when we're younger, time moves a lot slower. And so I knew, I said, man, if I'm coming home in my late 30s and I get back into doing the same thing I was doing prior to coming here, then I'm going to end up back in the same situation. And I didn't want that to be my final chapter. I didn't want that to be my story. And so I begin to think about the consequences of my choices and thinking about the choices that I had made that ultimately landed me here and thinking about the choices that I'd, I've known of other people who have made good choices and positive choices that ended up becoming a blessing to them. And it was during this time I was beginning to learn about the power of a choice and how 
One choice could change the whole trajectory of your life. That choice that I made that night to, to do the robbery and to, to sell drugs and, and do all the things that I'd done, those had stiff consequences. And I didn't realize that that night, November 2000, that it was going to change the whole trajectory of my life and it was going to send me down a path that I really didn't want to go. The good thing is something good came out of that. And uh, for today I'm forever thankful. You know, during that prison time, um, I, I was... I was brought to a place of being able to make Jesus Christ Lord of my life, and it flipped my world upside right, and uh, it changed my thinking, it changed my life, changed everything about it. And I got to spend the next 10 years of my life renewing my mind, my heart um, changing, uh, my heart being tenderized and sensitive, and really being molded into a person that I wasn't prior. Now, all of a sudden, guns and drugs and hurting people and all that, it wasn't attractive anymore. There was nothing of that lifestyle that I wanted to, to be a part of, that I wanted to do with that. My heart had become sensitive to those things. And I realized even though I'd given my life to God, I still had my ability to hustle. I still had my ability to recruit. But now I recognize that those gifts and abilities and talents were here to help empower people, not to destroy people's lives, not to sell drugs and, and hurt someone's mom and hurt someone's dad or someone's daughter, but these were here to uplift and empower people and to help play my part in cleaning up the mess that I had helped to make, but open up doors for many people. So I come home after serving 12 and a half years, and I get to this place, um, coming home, and after a couple of years being in, I had the opportunity to co-found an organization called Fresh Coast Alliance that specifically works with men and women coming home from prison. I had the opportunity of planting a church as well. And at this time, five years ago, we started out with just me and the other co-founder. There was two of us, uh, and now we have 26 employees, and we're able to help many people all across the state of Michigan, a housing program. We own and operate our own therapy practice. We have reentry, recovery coaches, and now I get to play a, make positive choices to have huge impact. I'm going to leave you with this. One choice can change everything, but always remember this. When you're born, you look like your daddy, but when you die, you will look like your decisions. So, Nate, today you talked about the power of a choice, and I'm just curious, what would you say is the most rewarding part about your life today because you're making good choices? Well, I think the most rewarding uh, part of my life today is, is, is the fact that part of it is this, is that I... I understand and I realize, and we all have a gift. Every single person does. We are all blessed with the gift to make a choice. It's probably the uh, w one most singular thing that has so much power invested in it that every single person who's ever been born has. And for myself, I understand that. I understood while I was incarcerated that one choice could literally ruin my whole life and lead me down a path of destruction to the point to where I couldn't point the finger at anyone and blame it on anyone, that that had to come all back on me. But I also recognized the flip side of that, that I could make a bunch of good choices, positive choices, that would ultimately set my life up for success. Now, someone told me this. It was shortly after I came home. Um, a guy told me this. He says, you know, you're the, you're the director and you're the producer of your own life's film. In the end, if it's a flop, you got yourself to blame. But if it's a hit, you got yourself to blame. Either way, it comes back on you. And every day we wake up and get to make hundreds and hundreds of choices every day. So I've fallen on the side to where I want to make choices that are going to be a benefit and blessing not only to my life, but also to my family. Because um, the truth of the matter for all of us is that every single one of us needs to be reminded of this that in every decision that we make, generations from now are going to reap what we sow. My grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, my great-great-great-grandchildren are going to reap the fruit, the benefits, or the curse of the choices that I uh, make and I get to pass on to my children. Thanks. You know, uh, I had the pleasure of getting to know you while we were both incarcerated. Uh, pretty much at the beginning of both of our our bits when we were first starting out. And for, for a short time, you know, we, we shared a cell together. And it, I remember going to segregation and then shortly after, you know, coming, 
coming out of segregation a few months later, I remember you had made another decision and, and you had made this decision to turn your life over to God. You quit smoking, you got rid of, you know, the freakery books, like you, you were done. What helped you through all those times where here we were in this environment where we're constantly, you know, being bombarded, being bombarded with negative influence. How did you continue to strive and thrive in that environment when you made a decision to turn your life over to God? Well, the, the, the number one thing was I, I for, for myself, I developed a life in the word. And practically speaking, along with that, knowing how to strengthen myself in the word of God, I also developed the, the, the habit of being thankful and being thankful for the things that I couldn't uh, necessarily control. You know what I mean? I could only, I could make a choice to wear either my uh, black uh, Oxford shoes or my white NDG shoes. I got that choice. Now, I didn't like either choice, but I, nonetheless, I had the choice. And I chose to be thankful for the fact that I just had a pair of shoes to have on. When I chose to take control of my own attitude, it changed the whole atmosphere on the inside of me. And it changed everything. And in that, I made it a point to make sure that I, I surrounded myself with other like-minded people. And I made sure that I surrounded myself with men who had made the same decision that I had made, but were further along than I was. And I had to become a student during that time and allow these men to pour into me and to share with me, not only from their successes, but also their failures on and, and give me wisdom on what to, to do and, and stayed around, you know, those types of men that were encouraging and knew how to draw the gold out of me. Because so much of the time in an environment like that, there's so much negativity and it's so easy to get pulled into that. You know, our past life, it's like a, it's like a well-worn pair of shoes. They always sit at the back door of our mind. The scary thing is that we can easily slip back into them and they're comfortable. And so you constantly have to stay on your deem. You constantly have to stay intentional at living life. Because the moment you, you do that, you begin to slip. It's so easy to go back in there because the, the old way of living, it's so comfortable. And it's important to be strengthened by other individuals, to have people pouring into us, and then also us having a group of people that we can pour into so that we keep what's on the inside of us fresh. There's something going out and there's co something constantly coming in. And trying to find those who are further along in their journey that have a wealth of insight, wealth of wisdom, things that they can pour into us. Someone once said this, he's, he says, experience is the wisdom of fools. And when you think of that, you think an experience is the wisdom of fools. When asked, he said this, he said, the reason he says that, he says, because there's too many people who have gone before you and they failed big time. And he says, real wisdom is when you can look at the failures of others and learn from them and don't experience it yourself. He said, if you can glean wisdom from their failures and their successes, you can bypass and go over a lot of heartaches and pains and you can accomplish in records time, which may have taken them years to find out. So being able to surround myself with healthy people, being um, intentional about the information that I fed upon and that, what I mean, stuff I watched on TV, the music I listened to, the books that I read, and eliminating those factors that brought discouragement and had an uh, attraction to the past life. Because too much of the time, people want to glorify sin. And for me, that just wasn't a part of it. I realized I put my work in and I've done that and there was nothing attractive about it because it landed me here and it had the potential power of destroying my life forever. So I didn't want to continue to flirt with that. So I put myself around healthy people, listened to healthy things and I read healthy things. And I took 10 years of doing that, which obviously set me up for doing what I'm doing now. Uh, it's those mundane things of life that always prepares for greatness. So it started out with in prison around healthy people and then continued that uh, when I was out here. The thing that made me continue that was the fact that uh, someone said once in prison, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So I said, hey, if my routine and all that isn't broke, then I don't need to fix it. Thanks, Nate. Thanks for sharing your story and thanks for sharing your heart with us today. You betcha. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Nate.